My name is David Martin. I'm a senior deputy prosecuting attorney from Seattle, Washington, and I manage the domestic violence unit there. And uh, we're lucky today because we're going to be hearing from, first and foremost, uh, Dr. Amy Bonomi, who is a uh, professor, Masters of Public Health, and now the uh, lead and founder of Social Justice Associates. Amy, could you introduce yourself for our colleagues in Estonia? Yes, thank you, David. Uh, looking forward to working with you today. Uh, Amy Benomi, founder of Social Justice Associates here in Colorado. And uh, we'll be talking to you today about domestic violence recantation, some best practices in prosecution. Uh, really come in on a David, David's office uh, there in Seattle. Yeah, so when we look at uh, the public health issue of domestic violence, when we look at the data here in the United States, about one in four women or 20, 25% have been impacted by domestic violence. When we look worldwide, that number is higher, somewhere in the range of 30 to 50 percent, depending upon the country. We know that true that for cases that reach the court system, about 80 percent of domestic violence cases involve what we call recanting victims or victims who uh, change their story or refuse prosecution in some way. 80% comes from the published literature. We know from, from case uh, studies, however, that that number is more around 95%. So nearly all victims will change their story in some, in some fashion. We also know that um, in the field that there's much judgment placed on the failure of victims to follow through with legal action of their abusers. So the, the non-participatory victim, et cetera, and professionals could get frustrated um, or retreat re recanting cases less seriously. Um, however, we know from David's work that recanting victims often signify uh, the most dangerous domestic offenders. And so rather than really shrink away from domestic, uh, from recanting victims, we need to be leaning into and trying to determine strategies to build trust. Uh, we also know that just as domestic abusers are very tedious in their abuse tactics and their attack of the victim, trying different methods to one method doesn't work, they'll try something else to manipulate the victim. Our professional response really needs to match that tediousness. Um, and so our professional response really needs the tediousness of uh, building trust with victims. Um, and we'll talk to you about that throughout the presentation. Right, so exactly, David. So when we look at the, the literature worldwide, um, the existing literature suggests that victims will recant or change their story based on fearing retaliation. Um, more severe abuse from the abuser. They may be financially and often are financially dependent or emotionally connected to their abuser. They may be concerned about their children, either harm, uh, future harm by the abuser to their children or their children being taken away. They are experiencing psychological vulnerabilities, many victims experiencing PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, depression, maybe interwoven with some substance abuse issues. Um, maybe they believe the crime is not severe enough. There's new data coming out um, worldwide really around this. And then they, some maybe feel that they're uh, mistreated or disillusioned with the criminal justice system and feel like, um, why would I come forward and say something when my abuser is merely going to get a slap on the wrist and, and then be out of, out of jail? And David, I don't know if you have other thoughts there. So today's goals, we'll talk first about an evidence-based model that uh, David and our team have developed uh, to show how abusers use technology to tamper with victims. We're, second part, we'll present new data on how abusers employ different but effective strategy to tamper with their victims when they do not have access to them, to them the victims directly. And then finally, we're going to discuss, discuss new models related to prosecution and recantation to really build trust with victims um, and kind of that um, being uh, very persistent in our approach there. Yeah, Amy, and, I, and it's interesting. We can give a little bit of the kind of the context to this that, you know, years ago, uh, for, for those of you in the audience, um, my unit uh, gained access to recorded conversations between offenders and victims because our jail uh, was recording these conversations as part of their security measures. That became very common in the United States about you know, 12 uh, or so years ago. Um, and we started to get a lot of calls by domestic violence offenders to their victims and they would go on for hours and hours. And it was um, remarkable, the type of things that people would talk about and what they would say. And we always knew that there was abuse that was still going on while people were in custody, uh, but we had really uh, no idea the extent to which it happened. And we needed um, professional, educated 
academic public health colleagues who could help us understand um, what it is that was happening here. And so we reached out to the University of Washington, we reached out to Amy, uh, and we said, Amy, here's, here's a whole bunch of these recordings. Can you tell us what they mean? So where did the recantation model come from? The goals of the model are really to describe how abusers use communication in that pre-prosecution period uh, before the trial to manipulate and coerce their victims to recant and describe how couples, abusive couples, construct the recantation plan once it's clear the victim intends to recant. Of course, the recantation has been manipulated by the abuser. So how was the model developed? Um, it really involved a team of, of seven to 10 professors, graduate students, and the prosecuting attorney's office, David's group. Uh, we did an iterative analysis of jail calls, listening to calls between abusers who were being detained and their victims. Often uh, these calls, they had multiple calls between the abuser and the victim, uh, upwards of 20 hours for some couples. All the calls were transcribed and analyzed for themes and really to better understand what was happening in that pre-prosecution period. What was the abuser saying to the victim to manipulate their story in the direction of recantation? Next slide, please. So as, as a result of that analysis, we devised a five-stage model uh, that really describes how and why victims recant. We'll take you briefly through the overview here and then we're gonna take each segment and play a few jail recordings to show exactly how it, how it occurs and the different types of emotional manipulation which you'll be able to hear during the calls. <clears throat> so starting with part one, uh, back up one sec, back up, yeah, sorry, um, is really the couple discussing the abuse event. So there's a lot of in these initial calls, mutual blame, as you can imagine, an argument, resistance of each other's accounts, the abuser saying one thing happened, the victims, uh, of course, resisting that account and saying something else has happened. The emotions in those early conversations are usually anger, uh, blame and regret. And then moving down to part two, uh, we see the perpetrator, the abuser, minimizing the abuse to lessen its severity. So of course, I didn't push you down the stairs like you think I pushed you down the stairs. It really wasn't that bad. You just kind of tripped. Um, here in the second calls, uh, we see the victim's agency or sense of self-determination tending to erode. Um, the perpetrator or the abuser uses something called, called a sympathy appeal, where he's appealing to the victim's sympathy. Uh, positioning himself as the victim, um, and then moving really uh, the blame to the victim. So, um, I, you know, I was just drinking. I don't usually act up like that. Um, please feel sorry for me kind of situation. Uh, the sympathy appeals we'll see throughout the presentation really was the manipulating point uh, that influenced victims in the direction of recantation. In part three, uh, the couple tends to bond together over earlier, happier times, maybe dreams of things that they have that they want to do in the future, such as get married and have children. Of course, this is fully manipulated by the abuser, uh, holding out hope, hope, for example, to the victim. Uh, I'm going to marry you, baby. Uh, just wait for me. I'll be out of here in a couple of months and we'll, we'll build a life together. It was very successful in manipulating the victim. In part four, typically we see the perpetrator, the abuser, act, asking the victim directly to recant. So, hey, I need you to go down to the court. I need you to say something that nothing happened. I need you to say we got in a car accident. You just bumped your head on the windshield. So a very specific request. Of course, the request for, for the victim or recant is reinforced by the sympathy appeals. So the perpetrator acting again like he's the, abu like he's the victim in the situation. And then the last stage, stage five, once it's clear the victim intends to change her story in some fashion, of course, manipulated by the abuser, uh, the couple then con constructs the recantation plan by redefining the abuse event to protect the abuser, blaming the state, blaming the government, and then giving each other specific instructions of what they're going to say in court. And David, I, please feel free to add here. Yeah, no, and, and Amy, I was going to, um, there was a there was a belief, I think, before your study came out that when, that when tampering intimidation took place, that um, it was always in the guise of threats of violence or threats of harm um, and the coercive aspect of things. And here, you, there is a lot of coercion that your paper recognizes and that you do have threats of harm, but those are not as great as what you found was a lot of really sophisticated and uh, I think you used the term tedious earlier, tedious manipulation <clears throat> where you have offenders who are constantly um, trying to 
get the victim to change their account in many, many different ways, most of them through sympathy. And I guess that was very surprising. And um, a lot of people kind of push back against that idea until they heard these recordings. So we're going to take you through each part of the model. Um, I think for time, we'll, we'll, sh we'll share some of the recordings as we move through here. And so, so in starting with stage one, so again, in these early calls, what we typically observe on couples is an argument over what happened during the abuse event and then resistance of each other's account. Uh, next slide, please, David. So here's an example of a couple discussing the abuse event. This was a couple uh, involving 19-year-old uh, abuser with an 18-year-old victim. And uh, David, please go ahead and play. Why are you constantly beating on me, though? I'm not constantly beating on you. You, you don't understand that you beat on me with words and I can't defend myself. With and if words, I try with but I words, don't hit you. But hit me, you hit me so fucking hard mentally. I'm a very fragile person. Mentally. Yeah, well, I, I would rather be um, verbally I, attacked. I would never want to be attacked. verbally attacked in my state. It's always a defense and then me get taken to the point where hey, you get my level going over the flip side and I lose it like the Incredible Hulk. Thank you, David. So typically, if we were in person, I would ask you, the audience, what you heard in this. Um, typically, what the audience says is a lot of manipulation, of course, by the abuser. So he's basically saying, look, you hit me so hard mentally. I'm a very fragile person, right? So he's kind of positioning himself here as a victim. There's a disagreement about what happened during the abuse event. Um, he said that he was really, she was really pushing him to the point where he lost it and became the Incredible Hulk. The Incredible Hulk, of course, is a, is a superhero um, who's a, a, a normal human being. And then when he becomes angry, he turns green, turns into a monster, and then uh, gets angry and smashes things. So he's really likening himself to a very violent uh, superhero. David, any other thoughts from you? Yeah, I just think it's, <clears throat> it's so interesting about this conversation that here you have the abuser and his victim having a discussion about the abuse event, right? And they're having what amounts to be a very kind of in-depth discussion about it, where he is subtly and not so subtly justifying what he did and blaming her for it. And um, and she is, she's pushing back, but this is not, um, this is pushing back with discussion, right? you could see the door is kind of open here. She's not saying, well, I can't believe you would ever try and justify this and cutting him off. Um, but instead, they're having a debate really about, you know, how would you like to be attacked? How would you not like to be attacked? Where violence is kind of normalized in the relationship. Yeah, exactly. So in stage two, again, this is a really critical part of the conversations. The perpetrator or the abuser tends to minimize the abuse to lessen its severity. In other words, I didn't hit you as hard as you thought I hit you. Um, the victim's agency that in this particular phase uh, tends to erode. So her sense of self-determination and sort of fight against the abuser to, begins to lessen as the manipulation continues. Uh, the abuser uses something called the sympathy appeal again to become the victim. Um, and uh, the, victim, uh, the victim in response uh, sues the, the abuser. So in stage three, uh, so we see the resistance of each other's account, the sympathy appeals, now we're in stage three, <clears throat> where the couple tends to uh, engage in invoking or calling up images of life, of life alone, what life would be like with, without each other, and then bonding over love, dreams, and memories. Um, typically in this phase, we often see the couple position themselves against others who don't understand them. So, for example, if you think about a relationship that you might have had in your early years, maybe as a teenager, maybe your parents didn't, didn't agree with that relationship, typically that forged an even closer bond with the person that you were dating, right? You're going to sort of position yourself against your parents who don't understand you. We see very similar tactics here uh, between these couples, but with very manipulated by the abuser. Next slide, please. So in this uh, particular slide, we see um, the abuser calls and he says, listen to me, this is your husband talking to you. Of course, this is interesting because this couple was not married, but he's positioning out this idea of, of being married as, you know, he's the husband, husband talking to you. Um, the Buddha, of course, is a religious deity, um, said we both need to listen to each other. So calling up this higher sort of power, uh, 
right? That's really important to me because I'm hurting right now. So there's a sympathy appeal. Um, I'm hurting because we don't listen to each other. So there's a sense of mutual blame that the perpetrator or the abuser is calling up. But if we start listening to each other, uh, from this point on, I'd like to start asking, acting like husband and wife. So he's calling up again this idea of an image of a solid, solid connection and bond. And <clears throat> the victim says, okay, we need to listen to each other. So this is an example of how they're kind of calling up these ideas of a, a stronger connection uh, that might, might actually be there and really bringing in this idea of marriage. This is a young woman. Uh, Teresa, who was uh, in a domestic violence relationship where she recanted and didn't cooperate with her longtime offender. And Teresa came from a very um, a strong family, two-parent household. Her parents were uh, employed. They had a they're solidly middle class in the United States. Her brother uh, is a priest. Uh, very strong values of this family. And uh, this young man would go to their home for dinner, and they seemed to think that he was a good guy. Um, but that previous text message was from him. And here are images of him communicating with her, convinced that she is with another man while she's off at college. And he would demand that she take photos showing him her watch and showing different outfits that she would have to change into to prove that these were not kind of dated photos from another time and that she was where she said she was, which was alone in her room. He was deeply, deeply controlling of her. And so I think this, you know, whether it's hypersexualized or hyper romantic or here hyper controlling of Teresa and what he ended up doing with Teresa in order to continue his extreme controlling behavior is when she finally, after all of this abuse, sought to break up with him, he killed her best friend in order to send her a message that this is what will happen if you try to leave me. Um, and it was a terrible, terrible and tragic case. Her best friend was an incredible human being who uh, was just um, house sitting uh, for the family while they were away. But again, another example of this extreme behavior here reflected in Teresa's phone. So in stage four, we see a specific request by the perpetrator or the abuser asking the victim to recant. Uh, we see the, the victim complying. Of course, the, com the compliance is manipulated. Uh, the abuser tends to reinforce the instructions for the victim to recant with sympathy appeals, uh, trying to conjure this uh, feeling of the victim feeling sorry for him. And of course, he's minimizing the abuse event as well. Next slide, please, David. And if you could play the recording, then we'll, we'll talk you through it. Oh my God, I love it. <laughs> I haven't been able to call you. All right, I gotta tell you something. Um, I'm going to the Supreme Court, okay. but you gotta be there and you gotta sit up front and you gotta tell them that what you wrote on the uh, police report was a lie, that you were just mad at me because you thought I was cheating on you with your cousin. If you say that, okay. if you say that, they'll automatically let you go. Okay. All right? Uh -huh. You know I love you. Uh -huh. They might give you five to ten days, but that's better than me doing 60 to 90. Me? Yeah, but, they, but, it's, but babe, that's better than me doing 60 to 90 days. They probably give you five days for filing a false police report. That's it. I don't want to go to jail for five days. I just spent five days in the hole. You can't do five days for me? And this is a classic uh, that we use in the trainings uh, because there's, you can hear so much manipulation going on. He starts off by saying, uh, look, you got to go down to the Supreme Court. <clears throat> you got to sit up front. You got to tell them that <clears throat> what you wrote on the police report was a lie. <clears throat> Excuse me, that you were just mad at me because you were cheating on my cousin. She's laughing, uh, going along with it. Um, and he says, if you say that, you'll aut that'll automatically let me go. Because <clears throat> if she says she lied, lied, she'll get five to 10 days in jail versus him doing 60 to 90 days if she doesn't go down to the Supreme Court and recant. So he manipulates her by saying like, look, I, already, I just did five days in the hole in solitary confinement. Uh, you can't do five days for me. So you can really hear the manipulation. And she's like, I don't want to do five days. And she says, I think rather than playing the audio tape here, just like in the interest of time, um, here you can see the abuser saying, uh, I'll see what the judge has to say. I'm going to say that I pretty much am going to stick to my story. I didn't even touch you. 
she said, the victim then says, I wouldn't do that because then you said you're lying. Be up front. I, like I was out of control drunk. I was in a blackout. I would normally, I would have never done something like that. And the abuser says, and then I need anger management. I need to start going to classes. I need to request days off. And then the, the victim says, but you need to tell the judge that you do need anger management. So he lets you out of there. You can really see them giving instructions on what to say in court to uh, get the abuser off. And Amy, I think it's also interesting here. There's a there's an aspect of the financial impact on this. And he he's pushing back on this day that I need to request days off from work to go to anger management. No. Yeah. And uh, you can see just how real life plays into what is going on in people's relationships. So in summary, what we see with a five stage model is that recantation tends to be influenced by coercion. So we hear that sympathy appeals that the abusers using are really the tipping point. Um, and manipulating the victim's emotions to want to uh, come in to, the, to the help of the abuser, Mi the perpetrator minimizing the abuse uh, by acting like it wasn't as severe as it as actually was, um, and then request, specific requests for the victim to recant. And then the couple really bonding over these ideas of life alone, uh, love, dreams, and memories, conjuring up this idea of marriage in the future, um, and then once the victim was moving in the direction of recantation, the couple would go about reconstructing that recantation plan to redefine the abuse to, to protect the perpetrator, blaming the state, and then giving each other specific instructions of what to say in court. This happens across um, class and race and all sorts of things. This is an image of a, of a couple from a very, very wealthy family in Seattle. And if you see in this photograph, uh, this young woman has a terrible black eye. And this is her boyfriend who her family knew that he abused her all the time, uh, very violently. And she would recant and she would threaten her family that if they ever told the police, um, she would never speak to them again. And they were terrified that they would lose their daughter forever if they talk to police about what happened. So they were forced to do things like even, this is a holiday photo, take a photo of her with him that she just accepted this violence that was happening. And the, and the way that we were ultimately able to prosecute this case is with his efforts to tamper with her when she did call police one time. Um, and Amy, I know that kind of technology and other things, we're looking for ways to intervene in the abuse pathway, so to speak, and how to how to free victims from this ongoing manipulation. Yes. And I think maybe it's just a perfect understanding of that is some of these uh, voice recordings that we have. And, I, and Amy, I'm not sure if you want to play these now or just kind of uh, we can go through them quickly. Yeah, and so this is a case that my unit handled. This is Clifton Bell, and it's- All you have to do is just give the prosecutor a call and just tell them that nothing happened. And your number is 296. Here he's giving the phone 9, number. 9, I don't know, baby. I'll see you soon. So uh, here the offender had called from jail and the victim had a uh, way for him to leave a message. And he left a message to call my office's mainline phone number. And then he is saying how much he loves her and leaves kisses over the phone. And Clifton Bell is a very uh, interesting case because he didn't have a, a documented history of abuse that was um, was concerned. I mean, it was a strangulation case and we had a felony. Strangulation is a felony in my jurisdiction. Um, but when you looked at Clifton Bell on paper, it was a young guy and didn't have a lot of abuse. It turned out that he had been abusing this victim for multiple years at center of the hospital multiple times, including raping her. Um, we had an advocate who formed a very close bond and an attorney who formed a close bond with her such that she was willing to share this um, fake phone number that he was calling her on. And then we were able to obtain all of the jail phone recordings. It was 17 hours of these recordings, which showed his manipulation. And we'll just go through these quickly. Um, but he would use multiple approaches, uh, in the ugly approach, he would use friends who would tell her not to testify and the calls showed vicious tampering that was being perpetrated through right, the I, friends. It's, sorry, it's hella important that I talk to you. Can you hear me? Yep. You want me to pass her that number or what do you want me to tell her? Dog, I want you to show up to her fucking work, 
Beat that bitch in the fucking face. In the fucking rap. God, give her that fucking number, dog. And tell her to fucking stick the fuck in the machine. Can you do that? So here we had Clifton Bell instructing a third party, his friend, to basically act as his enforcer against Jamie, his girlfriend. Um, this is a very mild representation of what he told this individual to do. He instructed him to rape her, to beat her, to do any number of terrible things to her to make sure that she would not cooperate with prosecutors. And if she don't show up, all three of them bullshit will drop. All that shit goes away. Yeah. And you give out just weekly or if it happens. Well, I mean, no, it's going to take a week because look, the child date after that, if she doesn't come for like a week, then it all goes away. So Clifton uh, has a very sophisticated understanding of what my court system will do, how much time they will give us to go find her, to produce her for trial, and that if we didn't have her for trial, he knew there was a strong possibility that we would not be able to prosecute the case. And so he's a sophisticated criminal actor, much more akin to what we see for kind of hardcore uh, criminal gang members than you would expect from a domestic violence abuser. And here, um, he would reach out, right? There were other messages that he would give to her. If you can't do that for me, I will kill your parents. He wanted to be with her. If I'm not alone, I don't care. I'll sit there forever. Um, I will kill you. Do you understand that? These are notes that our victim was taking uh, during some of the other conversations. So, Amy, I know when you're looking at kind of public health means and different ways that people would interway, intervene in uh, the relationship uh, to try and to, to stop the manipulation and stop the violence from happening, technology holds a lot of keys for that. Yeah, so, you know, we think about this five stage model that we would develop um, as we were kind of thinking about this. What if advocates were to use technology in a way to influence the pathway of what's happening in these conversations? So what if, for example, the advocates form the bond with the victim against the abuser? So what if the triangulation? And of course, that is the goal of advocacy is to build trust, build strength build relationship with the victim to help mitigate and buffer against the abuse and its impacts. So what if that bond was forged with, with the advocate and facilitated the victim's allegiance with the state uh, rather than the allegiance with the abuser? So really um, what we're talking about here is what the professional advocacies do um, is building that trust, building allegiance and helping to strengthen the victim's resolve um, against the abuse. David, anything you'd yeah, say? Yeah, no, and I, I think it's a really key point. So just to just to kind of give a framework of what we mean by advocate. And I think that word means a lot of different things in many different jurisdictions across the world. What we're talking about is essentially like a, what we would call a social worker in the United States, um, an individual who works in the community on behalf of the interests of the victim. Now, I have many advocates who work in my unit and even though they work for the prosecutor's office, their job and their goal is to work on behalf of the interests of the victim. So we are very clear about this. We want the victim's voice to be the primary thing that the advocate is assisting with. And this is critically important. Uh, victims need a friend. They need someone who can be a confidant. They need someone who can support them in this process because as we know from domestic violence, they are alone and they are isolated. And so advocacy and people who work with victims in, a, in almost a therapeutic sense, this is not therapy, but advocacy does provide support and it provides information and it provides a way for the victim's voice to be heard, which is diminished so much in a domestic violence relationship. And so if there is a way for these individuals, which are a key part of responding to domestic violence, prosecution is key, police are key, courts are key, just as key, just as important, if not more so, is this idea of someone who is working on behalf of the victim, an important part of taking a team approach to responding to domestic violence. So the victim technology, what we are looking at here, here's an example um, from the case that I talked to you about a little bit earlier. 
This is Teresa, the young woman whose friend uh, was ultimately murdered. Teresa, in breaking up with her boyfriend, reached out to an advocate by text message. In the United States, there are services where people can text the service to get advocacy or have someone to talk to about what's going on in their domestic violence. And here, V stands for victim, A stands for the advocate, and there is the victim reaching out saying that she broke up with her boyfriend because he's mean and abusive, um, but now he's trying to kill himself. This was a technique that he used to manipulate this victim by saying he was going to kill himself. And so here you have an advocate walking through what is happening and saying, well, yes, he's abusive, and we see abusive people threaten suicide as a way of keeping you with them. And so trying to coach and counsel our victim through what happened, um, and also to support them, support the choices that they're making, support the idea of what a healthy relationship looks like, and that leaving is okay, and that their safety is the most important thing. So this is a, an example of advocacy done very well, even by text message, back and forth. This is from a phone extraction that we had done of our victim's phone. Um, and here you can see a very good example of how advocacy can help someone navigate the process. So I think this idea of recantation and what does it mean for prosecutors? And I'm, uh, I'll speak now to, to those of you here, prosecutor to prosecutor. Um, I have done this work for 23 years. Uh, I have managed the domestic violence unit in King County for 15. Uh, I have prosecuted all manner of domestic violence case from the most minor uh, to domestic violence homicide, which is what I kind of exclusively do now. And I manage a group of many prosecutors and advocates in doing this work. And our foremost, and I think our forte, and what we are very, very good at is working with cases where victims recant. And it begins with this, you know, dispelling the notion that recantation means that victims don't care about the case or that um, recantation says something about the victim and our ability to pass judgment on them. The truth is we have to recognize the reality that many victims face that for retaliation, for violence, for manipulation, what's going on in the family, what's going on financially. This is something that the United States Supreme Court has recognized. Um, and this is a quote from a U.S. Supreme Court opinion, uh, the Davis opinion, that this particular type of crime is notoriously susceptible to intimidation or coercion of the victim to ensure she does not testify. And I think this is a really important quote from the most um, highly recognized court in the world, the U.S. Supreme Court. And the only thing I would add to it that the court doesn't mention is manipulation. Coercion, I think, is inherent with manipulation. Um, and it all comes back to understanding that victims have mutually exclusive and often competing demands. We hear victims uh, as on the phone earlier with their child. They want to preserve their family. Uh, many times they want to hold their loved one accountable, but they need to be able to be safe. And that recantation or non-cooperation often seems to be the safest course because they know what they have with the offender. If they can just uh, keep the offender happy, so to speak, and satisfied, they know they won't get hurt. And correspondingly with government or with systems, um, is there trust that we will be able to stop the violence and that we will be able to help them navigate and take another step in their life? And I think that culture that victims, can they rely on a system to do the things that they need done, does that exist? And so this idea of building culture and organizational change regarding recantation I think is the first thing that any group who is focused on domestic violence needs to do. That when you are building a response to domestic violence, understanding that recantation is the key part because it is the most common. And so you have to build a team with shared beliefs that accepts the notion that recantation happens and that it's the reality, it's that it's normalized. Recantation, of course it happens in cases. Look at all these pressures that victims are under. Look at what offenders are doing to victims, and that you have a team that is working to prevent it. And this in, has an important mindset component to it. I think it is very easy for prosecutors, for courts, for anybody who's involved in domestic violence to be frustrated by recantation.
if someone says something terrible that happened to them that it didn't happen and they are even angry at you for trying to do something about it the key is to have a very um solid mindset to not be frustrated don't judge but to be objective and that you need a good specialized team to help you do this lawyers alone cannot do this you have to work together with other people in your community some would call this a multidisciplinary team or a coordinated community response but the team has to be prosecutors working with their police working with their advocates or social workers working with their medical community and others and what's critically important also is to write those things down right just thinking that you know how everybody believes about things is not is not professional right professional organizations write down their beliefs they write down their mission they write down their principles and their goals and they use those to pass those things along to the next generation so it's recognizing the value and importance of recantation cases and i cannot stress this enough recantation makes up the majority of an individual prosecutor's caseload or any system's response to domestic violence is replete with recantation cases practically speaking if this is the majority of your work you need to find ways to get good at it and that means creating a culture that reflects that value and i think it really begins with how we treat victims one of the hard things to do is to make sure that victims are always being treated as best as possible to the highest and best way um what you say how you say it everything that you communicate to victims is important because they are being constantly manipulated by other people and so if we have um, systems that are not accepting of victims who recant or treat them badly or are not encouraging of victims it gives them an out right they don't want to participate they don't want to reach out for help because why would we help them if it's not a priority so instead um we have to have um good principles and those principles have to be constantly not just written down but you have to take action in doing that again i i can't stress enough this building a culture and you have to have a culture that supports victims and there has to be early outreach and advocacy and you have to have programs or build programs that provide services and if you don't have these programs because there's limitations on resources which everybody has all over the world no one has uh, as many resources as they need then you need to find people in your community who can help out whether that is a community of people who a uh, community-based non-governmental organization or even just volunteers in your community the little things make a great deal of difference and this is something my i spend i've spent years working on this idea of culture is critically important and so the strategies within that culture i think are also important and these are things that are practical that you can do in your own practice um first and foremost it's the priority of how much time it takes you to do this work do you know by looking at your caseload how long it takes you to do charges in a case to review a case or to resolve a case or take a case to trial delay in domestic violence is the enemy because it provides the offender more opportunities to manipulate victims we want to limit those opportunities so we want to act quickly we want to act with priority it also sends a message to victims that their case is a priority we also want to make sure our colleagues in investigation and police prioritize recantation and that they are investigating cases like there will be a recantation that they just know and normalize recantation as a part of their work we want to standardize our investigations there's certain things that i have and i'm happy to share this with all of you a list of what i expect law enforcement to do out in the field on a domestic violence case all of those things are contributing to my legal analysis of recantation the emergency calls which we have in the united states to 911 or body worn camera which we have in the united states which many jurisdictions now are having all around the world these things are incredibly valuable instances of evidence for preserving evidence about what happened first from medical affidavits phone evidence past history of abuse of course jail phone recordings and we want to connect with victims early that if we're providing for victims this will limit recantation or it will make victims at least want to cooperate and talk to us about what they want to see happen and this next part is uh legally work to admit past acts of abuse 
one of the key changes that was made about 20 years ago in the United States, at least in my jurisdiction and in my state, is when victims recant, it allowed the admission of prior acts of abuse to explain the recantation. And it allowed admission of evidence, affidavits, and things of the sort to prove the underlying crime when recantation happened. Mm -hmm. So recantation actually acts as a uh, an accelerator of evidence in the United States because courts then admit other evidence to come in to explain the recantation. We will use things like experts. You know, I, I would love it if Amy lived in Seattle and could just testify in all the cases that we have. Um, but oftentimes, um, we have become so practiced in our work that we don't need experts. We're going to go in and argue why the original report should be relied upon, and we're going to explain with the history of abuse and with other things why the recantation took place. And that is because this next issue is we practice. We practice recantation arguments. We practice the law of recantation. We uh, practice uh, our presentations to court. And we have become so routine at doing this uh, that we've become good at it. And we've been doing recantation cases ever since I've been a prosecutor for almost 25 years. And it always begins with doing it in one case. How can I prove a case to a court where recantation took place to convince judges, to convince police, to convince my court system and others that recantation is not an excuse to get rid of cases, but instead allows us to see that recantation acts actually the heart of domestic violence and that these are the most dangerous cases. Now, we have to do this practically. You cannot do this on every single case. There's plenty of cases with, we'll say, limited injuries that are lower level cases uh, or um, don't have uh, high levels of violence to them. We have to find ways to innovate with those cases. And we really have to prioritize cases of high violence cases of high level of recantation, and we have to find cases where we can build success in doing that. And that, again, means good investigations, exploring recantation, and finding ways to legally admit the past acts of abuse. And I know, I'm, I'm sure many of you will say, well, we can't do that in our jurisdiction. And that was true 25 years ago in my jurisdiction, and we just worked at it. We worked at it in our legislature, we worked at it with our judges and our case law, and we have kept at it, and year after year, it gets a little bit better with what we are able to admit and what we are able to do. And this really means putting the defendant in context uh, with your investigation and having something which is really focused on collecting that evidence at the scene, because a DV scene only can produce valid evidence for a short period of time because the scene will stop. The offender will either be arrested or there will be some effort to go apprehend this individual and then the victim will be alone and soon the offender will reach back out to be in contact with them, and then recantation and manipulation begins. So taking an extra few minutes to really do a good investigation at the scene with an eye towards recantation is critically important. Are there independent witnesses? Is there social media, video, cellular phone evidence? This depends from jurisdiction to jurisdiction as to what you can obtain, uh, but I would say that the phones often tell the story of a relationship. You'll see abuse on the phone. Um, is there a way to utilize and download those phones in a practical and systematic way? Um, is there efforts being taken to record the conversations that are happening from your jails where so much recantation takes place? Um, and again, coming back to the basics, which is the scene itself in domestic violence and having an eye towards recantation there. If we know that the victim is going to recant, we wanna make sure that we capture all of the statements of the scene, any writings, any type of forensic cellular evidence. And we also wanna make sure that any independent witnesses, they're also providing affidavits. We want objective evidence to corroborate what took place. And for prosecutors, of course, we have legal analysis that must take place from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. You know, Is there substantive evidence to meet the crime? Do you believe, after an appropriate review, that the recantation is untrue, that the crime took place? And will we be able to have the victim appear to testify? This is critically important. Victims in many jurisdictions need to appear to testify, and that's why early advocacy is so key. So many cases that my unit does involve victims who appear in court and recant, and they are not being prosecuted for false statements. That does not happen in my jurisdiction. 
Instead, victims are, are come in and they are examined about the underlying crime and they're examined about their recantation. And we want to expose the recantation as being false. And if I can disprove the recantation, then many times I can prove the underlying event. And that begins with having an advocate on the front end, building a relationship with the victim, even when they're recanting, especially when they're recanting. So they know that we are there to help them no matter what, and that we want them to come into court and tell their story. When victims recant in court, in court, um, what we see oftentimes is they're not very good at it. That when you push against the recantation, no matter what it is, victims are not very good liars. We know from Amy's work and from others that offenders are tremendous liars. They lie about everything. They're very good at it and they lie all the time. Victims are not this way. They're terrible liars. And so if we can expose the lie of recantation, this will lead to more convictions and this will lead to greater accountability. And that you can show that cases can be proven that the recantation is understandable. And this gives us a good foundation as a system to try and really respond to domestic violence uh, in, a, in a broader way. In my community now, when victims recant, it's just not a big deal. It's understandable. It's normal. Courts get it. We want to be able to provide interventions for people. But for those recantation cases, especially on very serious crimes, those cases are going to go to trial. And we're going to do our best to get convictions in those cases if we've done all the fundamental points along the way. So here's an example of even some flow charts that we do with our laws. We have laid out our evidence rules in a way to say, OK, well, what happens when a victim even says, I don't remember the abuse event? Happens all the time, right? That's an easy way to recant. I don't remember. Um, or it didn't happen and I don't know what happened. There are different rules that we have and we map these things out and we brief them and we follow up on them. What are the different ways that we can admit the statements in order to prove the case in spite of the recantation? And that's the key thing. And that is what our case law has led to for many years. And again, it comes back to this principle of focusing on the evidence and then focusing on the recantation as being the manifestation of tampering, coercion, and manipulation by the offender. And if we can expose the what lies under the recantation, our case will be very valuable. We can't do this all the time, right? But in many cases we can, and that will allow us to go forward with these recantation cases. So Amy, I know I've been, I've been talking for a, a while now, um, and we have a lot of different um, areas that we've talked about both the you know, the reasons why victims recant and some of the responses that we can do. But I think it really does come back to an organizational and individual commitment to prioritize recantation cases as being important work, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. and, and like, how can we have this be a value? There's no easy answer here. There's no kind of like magic thing that we can tell people to do and this will cure recantation for you. But it says an organizational commitment and this is important because it's the reality of domestic violence. Domestic violence is not like what people thought years ago, but instead it really reflects kind of what your research is, that it's its hallmarks are manipulation and coercion. I, yeah, I, I love everything you've shared, David, and I really love this idea that your, your unit is built around building culture, building a culture of understanding that recantation happens. This is how it happens. We need to expect it. And this is the multifaceted strategy that we're going to use to help help victims through this particular incident. And what I also love about what your unit is doing is the community-based linkages, because the more victims see a coordinated effort, your unit, other community-based organizations, see those visual cues in the community, the 5K run that your group does, uh, the various uh, linkages that you have with, with other advocacy organizations, I think it's really crucial for victims believing that yes, there is a unified group of individuals and organizations in my community that understand what I'm going through and that are going to help me through the abuse experiences that I'm having. And David, I think one thing that I'll add is, is what we talked about earlier is that abusers are very tedious in their manipulation of victims. They will try this strategy and if that strategy doesn't work, they'll try another strategy, then they'll do this. So at any given time, a victim might be balancing 300 different if then scenarios, if I do this, then this is going to happen to me. If I do that, then this is going to happen to me. 
And so I think we would argue that our professional response has to match that level of tediousness and that level of sophistication that the abusers are using to put victims in this, you know, if then scenario. Um, so as we might experience frustration as professionals and like, oh my gosh, she's changing her story again, that's the reality. And, and, and really, I, David, what I love that your unit's done is really, how do you support each other as professionals in helping victims through it? Yeah. And I think it's just also a recognition that it's not, it's not just one person. You have to have a team approach to doing this. And it, it, it does require good legal skill you know, from the from the prosecutor end, good investigation from police to give context and to really expose what's going on. And then critically important is victims need help, right? We What do we know? They're isolated. They're being manipulated. They're vulnerable. They're fragile. And they're not fragile in a sense of like they're not strong people because so many of the people that we that we profiled for all of you in Estonia were incredibly strong women. But we had offenders who tediously took advantage of them. Um, and so how can we then connect with victims to uh, to disrupt those bonds that offenders are trying to put in place and just support people through the process? At the end of the day, you'll get better outcomes, even if you're not able to get the, the, the kind of grand conviction with the offender going to prison and all this. At the end of the day, what victims will know and take away from their interaction with the system is, they were there to help me and they were trying with everybody else to help me. And so a community response to an individual that says, no, we're, you know, what happened to you is terrible. We're sorry for that. And oh, we're here for you. That's what you want. And that's, that's what, that's what kind of um, is successful here. Uh, we want the best for victims and trying to provide for them in different ways that's a you know the lawyer's job is to do the the lawyer end of things and we want advocates and others to do what they're doing really well and we can work in concert with each other to do better for victims i, th I think that's exactly one thing i was thinking of just as you're talking david is like in the same way that the abuser closes off all connections for the victim closes off connections with her friends with her family with with organizations our job and i think what david has described his units doing is really opening those connections opening those professional pathways back back up um, to, to, to help uh, the victim successfully navigate yeah. the situation. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think that that's a culture, that's a culture commitment. It's a strategy commitment, uh, organizational, it's individual. And, and I think it comes back to just understanding the basis of like, what is domestic violence, right? Let's begin with that. Like what is really happening in people's relationships? And then when you start to understand that, you're like, oh, well, of course, in order to stop domestic violence, we need to take steps as a community to try and prevent it. Prosecutors have a role in that. We should be supporting those who do prevention because we want fewer cases. Everybody should want fewer cases. And then we should also want to make sure that the interventions that we're doing for people really is supporting them and trying to make sure that they're going to leave healthy and productive lives. That's true for victims, especially true for victims. And also kind of on the back end, we, we know that offenders are going to get out of custody one day. Many, many offenders are going to get out of the system and we want to make sure that they have tools to have, you know, healthy, non-manipulative, non-violent, uh, non-coercive relationships. That's an entirely separate talk that we could go through and go through about the treatment interventions for offenders. But I think what this, uh, what Amy's work especially reflects is that that is hard to do. It's hard to do because offenders are engaged in a more sophisticated form of manipulation and abuse than they're given credit for. They're not some kind of cartoon character. Mm -hmm. They're sophisticated primarily men, almost you know, at least at the felony level. In my case, it is 95% men. And we have a handful of women, but primarily those are women involved in same-sex relationships. We also do family violence cases. There's women who are abusive to their parents as they get older in life. So that we don't often see women in intimate partner violence uh, using high levels of violence. It's very rare. Um, but I think, Amy, like at the end of the day, it's kind of this idea that recantation is important and you need to work collectively towards responding to it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, I, I mean, I think um, we want to take the opportunity to thank you uh, for being part of the conversation today and um, encourage you to uh, contact us with any questions. We'll be sending some materials along as well um, to help support the presentation today. Great. Thank you so much, Amy.
Thank you, David. Ja, suur tänu Emile ja Davidile ja üldepidi so miks üelda, et tänane päeva ongi sellega David. läbi, aga kuna sellele you could say that this has brought us to the end of this uh, day, but actually we received questions and they uh, cannot answer us right now. Then we have a good opportunity to get the answer from, from here. Ja, and uh, ja, please ja siis me saame edasi rääkida come, then, uh, um, we can continue very soon with the questions as asking them from Karin Talvist who will be speaking tomorrow so Karin Talvist please come here just a moment küsimused on järgmised and uh, the questions are the following. This is Tonya. Also use uh, the recordings of uh, phone calls made from prison in proceedings. No, they are not used to a wide extent because Estonia, in Estonia they are not um, recorded by default. To do it, we need a special permission and it's not a very common practice. I cannot say for sure that it has never been done. It's done more often in the case of organized crime. There, a lot of communication and organization goes on from the prison. But do you know some cases where this uh, recording has been used? Uh, domestic abuse where prison calls have been overheard? No. But is this kind of like eavesdropping done in domestic violence cases? It's possible that there are only a few cases like that. But uh, it's possible to follow messages. It's important. Yes. It's also possible to uh, follow the phone calls, eavesdrop, but it's not ordinary practice. Because in the case of um, domestic violence, most of them are reported after, afterwards, after the violence, rather than immediately. And then it's often that um, from their phones or computers they can get their conversation, correspondence. And I must say that the victims are getting better at it, especially if they have partners with whom they aren't living together. They are also recording themselves their speeches, uh, the, the phone calls. And there are also some other cases. For example, I had a case where the abuser had recorded a conversation that he had been having with the victim, hoping that he would get the victim to testify that uh, the things went the way as they were told by her to the um, law protection agencies. So, so it was possible to map the emotion. You saw manipulation there, and it was like a description of who, who's to be blamed there. I very much like this presentation by Amy and David. I actually also uh, proposed uh, calling them to, to perform here. And I uh, managed to listen to the presentation in Oslo uh, some time ago. I really liked it. And I think it's very important that all the procedures, uh, also judges in Estonia, uh, it's important that they saw this uh, presentation. And I hope we can use this uh, presentation also outside the conference, the training. Now, question. Uh, what kind of attitude do um, uh, legal officials have uh, towards recantation? I would say we're moving towards the place where, about which David talked about. I cannot see that right now our, our, our judges and lawyers would react this, in this ideal way. But it's known that uh, this recantation is common. It's not rare. The percentage, 80%, sometimes 
sometimes even 95% give up their uh, testimony or start to change or work against the proceeding. By my own experience, I would say the numbers here are quite sim similar. Thank you, Kairi.